Thanks, Charles, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, just as an interesting factoid, uh, I trained at UC San Francisco under the tutelage of Dr. Wilson, Charlie Wilson, and uh, it was an interesting year because there were two other fellows that I trained with. Um, one was Dr. Berger, who you're going to hear next, and the other was Dr. Prados, who you've heard uh, his lecture this morning. So I'm, I'm sort of humbled by their company. Um, they have, Mitch spent a bit of time here at the University of Washington before going to UC San Francisco, and Mike found that home and, and never left. Um, so here we are. So I'm going to talk about uh, WHO grade two and three tumors, see if I can uh, not be technically challenged. Um, and um, it's probably reasonable now to begin calling these lower grade gliomas, and, and we'll come back to this distinction about how we slice things uh, morphologically. Um, and, and I would say and argue, and yes, it's been a theme, and I think it, it sort of began with one of our earlier lectures of this concept uh, that we can begin to genotype these tumors, and this probably has relevance in the clinic. And, and that's what I am. I'm a clinician. I'm not a researcher, uh, per se. So I'm going to keep this very clinically relevant, I hope. Um, and, and so the, the big changes, I think the fundamental changes that we've seen in these tumors has been molecular diagnostics, uh, of which we, we had a little, uh, little preview with respect to glioblastoma um, from Dr. Holland. And then as well, how this has impacted our management of grade two and grade three tumors. And, we, and we've actually had fairly large trials that help inform uh, these changes. All right, so oops, I skipped one, sorry. So, Start with low-grade tumors, or so-called uh, WHO grade two tumors. Um, now, this is what we would say. This is kind of evidence-based that we would observe these tumors if they're low risk. We divide these tumors into two categories: high risk and low risk. I'll come back and explain what I mean by high risk. Um, in high risk tumors, um, now it, we have a randomized trial that suggests treatment with radiation therapy following maximum safe surgical resection with PCV chemotherapy, so a triplet therapy. Um, and that chemotherapy is really reserved outside of that situation to clinical trials and in the recurrent setting. So one question is, why would we treat these tumors at all? I mean, it, I think when many of us started in this field, at least certainly Mike and I, these were considered benign gliomas. There were lots of individuals that felt that we could watch these over time, and there was no reason really to intervene. Um, one, I think it's important to establish a diagnosis. Uh, I think that's critical. Patients having things in their head and not knowing what it is is, is disconcerting. Um, many times they have symptoms that relate to the tumor itself, and so there's palliation by removing the tumor. Uh, I'll show you data that indicates clearly that these progress over time. These are not static lesions, but dynamic lesions that change over time. And then lastly, um, there's an extremely high risk that these tumors will de-differentiate to higher grade. And, and that takes on a more malignant phenotype, and I can show some data that supports this as well. So th this is the data uh, this is from the Mayo Clinic uh, looking at, at, at a fairly large uh, uh, constellation of tumors. And our, our typical morphology classification of low-grade gliomas is astrocytomas, oligoastrocytomas, and oligodendrogliomas. And you can see that they all have some percentage will have uh, a dedifferentiation and an evolution into a higher grade tumor. Um, and that will change survival because at time of transformation, these tumors have relatively impoverished survival overall. So, so that's, a, that's a big issue with watching these tumors and doing nothing. Um, this is mostly data from the French. And the French have shown essentially all of these tumor in natural history studies uh, will evolve and grow over time depending upon how you measure it. Um, and we know that they have a pre-symptomatic phase, and we occasionally see patients who have been in an MVA come in, have a scan, or discovered to have a tumor, but otherwise were asymptomatic. And then they'll hit a symptomatic phase, oftentimes with a new onset seizure or headaches, and they have this kind of latency phase where it appears as though the tumor is not really growing unless you have long intervals between scans, but in fact they are growing if you measure these carefully. And then they have a progressive phase where these tumors become either aggressive and remain grade, low grade, uh, or became uh, undergo malignant transformation. So um, as Dr. Holland alluded to earlier, uh, he talked about these clouds. Uh, everyone talks about clouds this morning. Um, that we know that astrocytomas uh, are identified 
primi primarily by p53 mutations, IDH mutations, and ATRX mutations. And so the ATRX mutation, and, and, and all of these can be done by uh, simple uh, immunohistochemistry, uh, will identify tumors as astrocytic uh, in lineage, having uh, the ATRX mutation. So that's a, that's a lineage-specific marker that can be used. Similarly, in oligodendrogliomas, we have the 1P19Q co-deletion identified, at least in the United States, primarily by using FISH techniques. Um, and both of these tumor types, these low-grade tumor types, have a very high incidence of the IADH1 mutation, uh, which may be a progenitor, uh, a driver mutation that leads to these tumors in gliomagenesis. And then lastly, we have this oligoastrocytoma complex group of patients. And these appear to be an admixture and probably no longer are actually a recognizable entity, but rather these tumor types are separable into either an oligodendroglioma with 1P19Q lineage, uh, or they'll be recognizable as an astrocytic tumor with ATRX uh, mutation. Uh, so that, that we're sort of moving away from this idea of a three-tiered uh, morphologic classification. Now, the molecular diagnostics has really exploded. Um, and I'm just showing uh, four of the major papers that came out last year uh, that indicate using a relatively small set of tools, uh, one can begin to identify, uh, I'm not sure where the, oh, um, uh, identify these three subsets uh, of tumor types. Uh, and and uh, most IDH1 mutant co-deleted tumors are going to be oligodendroglial, it will constitute about 30 percent. Uh, most tumors that are IDH1 mutated and not deleted for the 1P19Q, either uni or non-deleted, represent astrocytic tumors. And then we have this wild type group. Um, and, and depending upon the system that one uses uh, and the tools uh, to use molecular pathology, one can define generally these three groups. Uh, the UC San Francisco and Mayo Clinic group uh, divided these further, but some of these subsets are seen in less than 5% of patients and uh, are of less clear relevance. So why does this matter, uh, identifying genotype? And I think it matters primarily because it impacts in a significant way survival. And this is really with standard treatment um, that we can be begin to predict that these oligodendroglial tumors that are 1P19Q co-deleted and IDH1 mutated uh, as well as GSIM positive, uh, as indicated earlier, have a relatively good survival uh, relative to patients uh, who are wild type and non-deleted. And I would argue that this data probably is changing um, even as we speak. So uh, Dr. Berger is going to spend, I think, uh, a lot of time on this subject. But this whole concept that surgical resection matters, that extent of resection matters, uh, the challenge has really been that these are all retrospective data. We don't really have any perspective data that indicates that this is, in fact, so. But I would say that that's a kind of a general theme uh, in neuromythology that, that we believe extent of resection matters um, and that patients who have larger resections uh, do better. Um, and that includes low-grade tumors as well as high-grade tumors. So what informs us uh, as to how to treat these patients? Uh, we have actually you know, six randomized phase three trials that tell us how best to treat these patients. Um, uh, we have what, what I like to call uh, the non-believers trial. So this is a trial looking at surgery and observation only versus surgery plus radiation therapy, and actually showing that overall survival was the same, albeit there's a progression-free survival advantage in patients who receive upfront radiation therapy. And this is all comers. It's not, per se, dividing uh, low-grade gliomas into high and low-risk groups. And then we have two trials that inform us, uh, basically the believer trials, using low-dose or high-dose radiation therapy, showing really no difference in outcome, suggesting that low-dose would be preferable given the neurotoxicity, uh, late consequences of, of radiation therapy. Uh, and then we have the most recent trial, and I'll come back to this, the RTO G9802 trial that took high-risk patients and suggested for the first time that there was a role for adjuvant chemotherapy in this group of patients. And, and, and part of our challenge has been is how we define high risk. And I'll come back to that as well. And then we have this large trial from the ERTC, the European organization, uh, that suggests, uh, or at least asked the question, was there a superiority if we use temozolomide-based therapy following surgery with deferred radiation therapy versus using surgery followed by radiation therapy in what they define as high-risk patients? Uh, and this was a superiority trial and failed in that regards, but the data is interesting nonetheless. 
and I'll come to that. So when we define high risk, low grade gliomas, there have been basically three categories that define this now, which makes it somewhat confusing in the clinic. The classic has been from the earlier trials from the ERTC that suggest you needed three of these five criteria, the so-called Pignati criteria, to define a high-risk patient. And that would be a patient that we would traditionally today think might benefit from radiation therapy and adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, high risk was defined differently in the most recent ERTC trial, comparing uh, a temozolomide-based therapy versus radiation therapy. Um, and they used uh, age again, uh, progressive disease and refractory seizures. So that's a whole new definition that really had never been applied or actually validated. And then lastly, and perhaps most challenging, is the RTOG new definition of high-risk patients, which I would argue constitutes probably at least 60% of all low-grade gliomas, suggesting that those patients would be defined as high-risk and therefore would best be treated by radiation therapy followed by PCV chemotherapy. This is data that supports that position. Uh, it's not yet published. It's been presented uh, two times um, at meetings, and we're still waiting for publication. And one of the challenges in this trial has been that molecular markers were not introduced as part of the study itself. And, and I'll show you as we move through this how important that is. So, so this is really without molecular markers, but suggest uh, no matter, if you look at radiation therapy versus radiation therapy plus PCV chemotherapy, there was almost a two-fold increase in survivability with adjuvant chemotherapy. And so this has really become a new standard of care for the 60% or so of patients who have uh, high-risk, low-grade gliomas. So let's, let's segue to so-called World Health Organization grade 3 gliomas, or so-called anaplastic gliomas. So if we look at what happens in practice, um, not surprisingly, there's a, there's a wide range of treatment. Uh, patients uh, may be treated with Temodar only, with radiation therapy as consolidative therapy. They may be treated much as we treat glioblastoma, as Dr. Pratos had indicated earlier. Uh, or they can be treated with temozolomide as a primary therapy and then have deferred radiation therapy. And these are in patients that have uh, co-deletion of the 1P19Q. Uh, in patients that have anaplastic glioma that are uni or non-deleted, Generally, these patients, in most individuals, uh, neuro-oncologists, oncologists, will treat these patients much like a glioblastoma. Well, I, I would say that we have some data that actually helps inform this uh, as to perhaps how we might optimally treat such patients. That we use 1P19Q, obviously, as a tool to define how we treat patients. And in patients who have the code deletion, these are patients that are going to be treated uh, based on two randomized trials that I'll speak to. Uh, that show that radiation therapy plus adjuvant PCV chemotherapy would be the preferred therapy for such patients. Uh, with respect to the non-deleted group of patients, which is the larger group of patients with anaplastic gliomas, uh, CATNON, which was a, a trial that closed last year, now informs us that these patients are best treated with maximal safe surgical resection, followed by radiation therapy, and one year of temozolomide. And we'll, we'll come to that in just a sec. So if we look at uh, sort of the mutational landscape of these patients, uh, it, it really looks and, and very much replicates uh, that that we see for low-grade gliomas in that if we look at anaplastic astrocytomas, they're basically defined by IDH1 mutations, ATRX mutation, that so-called signature mutation for astrocytic lineage, uh, and the P53 mutation. If, by contrast, we look at anaplastic oligodendrogliomas, uh, again defined by IDH1 essentially not have ATRX mutation, or P53, if these are mutually exclusive. Um, and as well, all of these tumors will generally will have 1P19Q code deletion. And importantly, we have these two genes that have been identified uh, in relationship to the 1P19Q deletion that now probably inform us with respect to uh, probability of outcome in patients uh, who particularly have the, the CIC gene, uh, which is seen in about half of patients uh, with anaplastic oligodendrogliomas. So much like low-grade gliomas, WHO grade 3 gliomas, we again are dividing these into, into three, but three bins, uh, patients defined by IDH wild type, those with mutation, either co-deleted or non-co-deleted. Uh, and I think, I think it's increasingly recognized that the molecular classification really at this time is defining the biologic origin of these tumors. And the grading, you know, whether they're grade 2, grade 3, or grade 4, really reflects a stage in the tumor progression itself. 
Now, the Germans have recently uh, published a paper comparing IDH1 mutated grade 2 tumors, astrocytic tumors, to WHO grade 3 anaplastic astrocytomas that are IDH1 mutated and actually show little or no difference between these types, suggesting this, this, this rather subjective classification system that we've used for so many years is now collapsing and perhaps simplifying where these tumors are now considered astrocytic tumors that are IDH1 mutated and all behave in a very, very similar manner. Um, more, in a more, far more uh, difficult and, and, and challenging group of patients is the IDH1 wild type patients, uh, whether they are defined as low grade or anaplastic. And these patients probably now subdivide into four categories. Uh, many of which basically replicate uh, the behavior of glioblastoma, uh, one with a, with a distinct uh, glioblastoma type profile, albeit it has a relatively long survival for that. And then there are groups that, that morphologically look like astrocytic tumors, but in term, actually in terms of their molecular profile turn out to be more closely related with grade one tumors, whether they're DNETs or gangliogliomas. So this is from the German uh, network. Um, and, and just recently published in Cell, uh, but from the TCGA and, and Verhoek uh, and, and company is doing is really looking at the same thing at this group of wild type tumors and, and divisible into these multiple groups, two of which represent uh, a glioblastoma like one a unique glioblastoma with a longer survival, and then a, a, a pilocytic astrocytoma like group. So in terms of the trials that actually inform us. Uh, for the co-deleted group of tumors, uh, both the ERTC and the RTOG ran similar trials um, in patients who were anaplastic oligodendroglial tumors um, and compared radiation therapy with PCV chemotherapy. The difference is really on neoadjuvant or post-radiation therapy uh, and basically showed the same thing, that with the inclusion of PCV chemotherapy in patients who were co-deleted, we double survival versus patients who get radiation therapy only and chemotherapy, including PCV, in a deferred manner. Um, we've had some recent data, um, all of which really in, in, within the last year, and almost all of which is from the French, uh, suggesting that this, this group of patients, this co-deleted group of patients that have relatively long survival between 12 and 14 years when treated with RT-PCV chemotherapy, there's a subgroup that doesn't do nearly as well. And can we identify that group of patients? And the French have attempted to do this and suggest uh, a mutation in, in, in an oligodendrocyte-related uh, transcription factor, CCF12, which is seen in a very small fraction, predicts for worse behavior. Uh, uh, perhaps more importantly is identifying the CIC gene, uh, which is identified in nearly 50% of co-deleted tumors. That predicts for a worse survival. Uh, and similarly, uh, recently published looking at loss in, uh, or deletion in, in, in P, which uh, and, and, and chromosome 9 uh, uh, for this double tumor suppressor gene uh, also predicts for a worst outcome. So there, there are a couple biologic markers now that will indicate even in a, in, a, in a group of patients that you would generally think in the clinic might do well, we can actually predict probably won't do well. Um, if we look and, and segue to the non-deleted or the uni-deleted group of anaplastic gliomas, which constitute the largest group of such patients, we've had very few trials, two of which I've already shown. Uh, those were in anaplastic oligodendroglial tumors, but in both groups of, of, of patients who were otherwise identified by pathologists to represent anaplastic oligodendroglial tumors, uh, more than half and upwards of three quarters, in fact, represented tumors that were essentially non-deleted and therefore constitute this, this anaplastic uh, 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 astrocytic type tumor types. And one can see survival in these patients is really quite different regardless of the therapy that we use. And Susanna Chang from uh, UC San Francisco recently presented data on the RTG, uh, RTOG 9813 trial comparing BCNU or any nitrosiurea to temodar in an upfront setting and suggested that in patients that were mutated, IDH1 mutated, they had relatively long pro and prolonged survival relative to patients who were wild type. And, and that, that's a big issue with many of our older trials where we've not had this molecular analysis. And so it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult to harmonize this data. Um, we know from uh, at least the RTOG trial in the anaplastic oligodendroglial setting 
that even in patients who were non-deleted, there was a group of patients that had benefit from the inclusion of radiation therapy followed by PCV chemotherapy. And that group of patients perhaps is defined, again, by the IDH1 mutation and the ATRX mutation. Um, and, and this data has really been uh, supported, I think, uh, in the context uh, of, of the CATNON trial, uh, which closed last year and was uh, recruiting patients, over 700 patients uh, who were non-co-deleted uh, and treated with one of these four different kind of treatment strata and have now concluded on, a, on an early analysis that patients treated <laughs> with radiation therapy followed by 12 cycles of temozolomide had superior outcomes to patients treated with radiation therapy or radiation therapy plus temozolomide only. So that's practice changing. Uh, and we're looking forward to more data and certainly more molecular data to help inform who that is. The other trial that's ongoing right now that potentially can be practice changing is PCV chemotherapy is more toxic than temozolomide therapy, as many of you know. Uh, and there's a, a, a trial run primarily through Alliance um, looking at patients who are co-deleted, collapsing the grade 2 and grade 3 because those appear to be a single entity, and comparing radiation therapy followed by either by temozolomide or followed by PCV chemotherapy. So I'm just going to conclude that uh, taking care of brain tumor patients is not just about managing genotypes and phenotypes in the clinic. I mean, there are a lot of issues that come up. Uh, we deal with seizures all the time and drugs uh, to manage seizures. Um, it seems like I'm constantly fussing with corticosteroids and trying to get patients off of it because of toxicity associated with that. Higher risk for uh, emboli. All of the toxicities that we induce, whether it's chemotherapy-related, targeted-related, or radiation-related, um, and, and, and significant neurocognitive issues that come up in the context of treating these patients. And, and I don't know, I use this as sort of a, a, a way to manage patients in the clinic um, that, if possible, use an evidence-based uh, treatment. I think the corollary to this is even possible interpatients on clinical trials. Secondly, you have to keep an open mind. I can assure you there's always going to be something you've never seen. Um, uh, thirdly, avoid surprises. Recognize that there are going to be deviations from the norm. Uh, there always are. And then lastly, and I think very importantly, uh, is know when to conceive. I don't think it's ever too early to introduce end-of-life discussions, uh, particularly patients with glioblastomas or IDH1 wild-type uh, gliomas. Uh, and with that, um, we'll all come up for air. And um, thank you. Mm -hmm.